And this is the big hall. Yeah. This episode of Peter Cafe is filmed in a new library on the People's Daily Complex, where many antique collections are stored. Wow. How old are these newspapers? 1940s, 1940s. Yeah. The original version. They were printed in the wartime. Yeah. It was a really difficult time. This was Our guest today is very special. He studies phenomenology. Yeah the philosophical study of the structures of experience and consciousness. I know that you still don't understand what phenomenology means, but Professor Dema Moran will explain it to you in simple language in the interview. So we're going to sit like here. This one, okay. Hello, uh, Professor Moran. Welcome to PD Cafe. Thank you, Zhu Yang. Thank you for inviting me. You study phenomenology, and mm. most of the audience, actually, I, I believe they have no idea what is phenomenology. Could you please use very simple language <laughs> to tell our, our audience <clears throat> what is phenomenology? Yeah, well, I, um, I wrote a book on phenomenology, and I have to say, even my students in uh, Ireland and in America find it difficult to pronounce the word, never mind understand uh, the idea. So phenomenology uh, was founded as a new way of doing philosophy in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And I think the main idea is that we must return to our uh, subjective experience, mm -hmm. how we experience the world. For example, uh, when you are looking at an artwork uh, you are completely absorbed in the meaning of the work. The question is, why does it have this kind of attractiveness for you? So we are looking at the subjective side of experience. Um, you know, because all our experience is through our individual uh, consciousness. So phenomenology is in some respects a science of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's quite interesting. So what do you think that phenomenology, to, what, what kind of guidance or inspiration phenomenology could bring to the general public in our daily life? Well, <clears throat> the phenomenologists, um, in, they were first of all in Germany and then in France, included people like Jean-Paul Sartre, the French existentialist who came with uh, Simon de Beauvoir to, he came to China here many years ago. And <clears throat> what they bring is the emphasis on the importance of our own experience mm -hmm. uh, and to trust our own intuitions about the world. So first and foremost, we must start from our own perspective. I think that what you can learn from that is that everybody has their own perspective and it's very important to trust that so we don't forget about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And in that way, we can um, uh, gain a confidence about how we um, act in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's very much about self-experience and mm -hmm. self-reflection. So we just focus more on ourselves, our self-consciousness. We um, start there. We don't end there, because otherwise we would be very selfish. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just to know that we, are, we have to appreciate the human way of experiencing. And that way we have to bring that into everything we do, mm -hmm. you know. So we are having coffee now, right? which is nice. Mm -hmm. So do you think phenomenology is being tested by the practice? It very much has been tested in practice. And let me give you an example. You know, we are right now, to this week, we not only have the World Congress of Philosophy, but I learned yesterday that there's a World Conference of Robotics. Mm -hmm. And that's a good question as to whether maybe this... Uh, robotic uh, development of artificial intelligence will need to look at phenomenology to understand what's missing in the robot, namely the human perspectives, consciousness, our own feelings and experiences. In phenomenology, there's a lot of interest in how it is that, uh, you know, what it feels like to touch something with all the different fingers. Mm -hmm. You know, a robot doesn't feel so, you know, the phenomenology can perhaps balance, give, a, give a new perspective, even to artificial intelligence. The 24th World Congress of Philosophy was held in Beijing in August, and philosophers from around the world discussed emerging global issues. Five plenary sessions, 10 symposia, and 99 group discussions formed the Congress agenda. The 
24th Wat Congress of Philosophy is being held in Beijing from August 13 to 20 with the theme of learning to be human. And it's the first time for China to be the host of the Wat Congress and the second time an Asian country hosts the Congress. So what observation have you had so far to this year's Wat Congress? And what do you think is the significance of the Wat Congress to be held in China? Well, Zhou Yan, it is really the most important Congress, uh, I think, that has ever been held. They started in 1900 in Paris, and we held it every five years uh, since the Second World War. So we're in the 24th Congress. Oh, it's a long history. Yeah, yeah. but this is the largest one ever, mm -hmm. because there are more than 8,000 people, and probably about 2,000 students. So there's a huge uh, audience of philosophers. Probably half of those are from China, the rest are from outside, from the international world. Mm -hmm. There are more than 120 countries represented. And it's really going to be very important for China because the people in the international world don't know that much about Chinese philosophy. Mm -hmm. So this is a great opportunity to learn about the great traditions of Chinese philosophy. And I spoke about that in my opening ceremony. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's also very important for Chinese philosophers to meet the international world. Mm -hmm. So speaking of Chinese philosophy, uh, which philosopher or philosophical theory are you most interested in? Why? I was a student in the early 1970s and mm -hmm. there was just the beginning of knowledge of Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were interested in the I Ching. And then I started to read Confucius's Analects. And then I took a proper course, so I did learn, you know, about Confucius, Mencius, mm -hmm. uh, Chuangzu, Lao Tzu, and Chu Si, and then Wang Yangming. So I learned the history of Chinese mm -hmm. philosophy. But I think if somebody says, where should you start? I think start with Confucius. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, and I feel that here this week, I think the Confucian tradition is very deeply inter integrated in China in the everyday culture. Yeah, that's true. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you want to understand China, you really need to understand Confucius. That's yeah. my feeling. And it's almost the core value of our Chinese culture. So in your welcome speech of the opening ceremony of the World Congress, you mentioned that uh, we live in mutual dependence. Yes. Uh, what the philosopher Edmund Husserl called being with one another. How do you think the world community could improve in this aspect? Well, you see, as you said, the Confucian tradition, which is very deep in uh, Chinese culture, puts a strong emphasis on the interrelationship between family and mm -hmm. people, you know, father, father-son relation, sister-brother mm -hmm. relation, uh, the communal relationships. Mm -hmm. And I think for a long time in modern Western philosophy, there was too much emphasis on individualism. Mm -hmm. And I think now that the... Uh, the West is becoming more aware uh, of the need to, uh, to be sensitive to protecting communities. Mm -hmm. For example, in Europe, there's really an effort now to protect the different linguistic traditions of all the different European countries. Mm -hmm. So there's something like 27 official languages in Europe. That's very complicated. Mm -hmm. But it's a way of protecting the human heritage. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the great uh, challenges for us. So certain things have to be, uh, we have to recognize we depend on others. And I think actually Chinese philosophy has always understood that concept of nature as a sort of very delicate mm -hmm. balance and that human beings have to be in harmony with nature. From the perspective of a Western philosopher, what is the difference from the, our domestic philosophers in terms of observing on modern China? Well, you know, modern China in some respects, I say to people, when you go to China, and sometimes you're seeing the future <laughs> because things are moving so fast here. Mm -hmm. I was amazed that young people in China, they really just use the phone for everything, including for paying for taxis and restaurants and everything, yeah. and even for ID. Yeah. And so they don't bring any money and uh, they don't have any uh, uh, other documents, yeah. uh, no pen and, such, and mm -hmm. just the phone. I think that uh, Perhaps uh, Chinese philosophy was a little bit inward looking, you know, because it's a huge place. China will have to realize that the world is very diverse. I think that's been emphasized all the time. Mm -hmm. And we have to have new ways of understanding this diversity. Mm -hmm. And the same for the West, that we have to include China now in everything. For example, I'm moving to America and 
America doesn't have any fast trains. I mean, they have depended so much on the motor car. We have to think seriously about this for more ecological movement of people. Yeah, I agree. And that's why the high technology also makes China becomes an indispensable part of the world development. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we are not just dependent on China for the high technology and manufacture, but also in the past people were expecting uh, Chinese to recycle all our waste in the West. We used to send to China, but now they're stopping that. So uh, I think that uh, China has emerged now as a very powerful voice in world uh, affairs. This is a very delicate balance, you know, and I'm hoping that we, through this exchange with philosophy, can begin to get a kind of reasonable voice into the mm -hmm. debate. Okay, thank you, Professor. We had a really relaxing conversation. Maybe most of our audience think philosophers look maybe serious and mysterious, but you give a new image of philosopher. Thank you. Well, I hope here. that means that some people will start to study philosophy. <laughs> I believe so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Choya. Yeah, okay. My interview with Professor Moran was pleasant and animated as he interspersed the discussions with bits of humor and left out philosophical jargon and oh. academic concepts. <laughs>